The MLB trade deadline is just around the corner. Outside of the playoffs, it's debatably the most exciting week of the entire season. We find out who's contending, who's pretending, and who has no idea what the hell they're doing. Some of the best trades are the teams cashing in on players heading for a tight window, with only a couple months left before hitting free agency. These are called rental trades, and a lot of them happen in baseball. This year, there are some really interesting rental trade pieces. Chicago White Sox starter Lucas Giolito, Padres closer Josh Hader, oh, and maybe the greatest player ever to pick up a baseball too. So in honor of the ensuing festivities, let's take a look at the best of the specific genre of trades. Let's also set some quick ground rules here. Winning doesn't necessarily matter. A lot of the picks featured today were for teams who bought in big and didn't end up winning at all that season, despite their rental player excelling. I'm also measuring what you gave up. For example, the 2014 Orioles got a ton of mileage out of dominant lefty closer Andrew Miller, but gave up a future reliable starter to the Red Sox in Eduardo Rodriguez. That takes that rental trade from great to just all right, even arguably bad. I've also already made some videos about some of the more famous rental trades in baseball history. So if you're planning on cooking up a comment about why I didn't include CC Sabathia to the Brewers or Randy Johnson to the Astros, I highly suggest you check out those videos. Okay, enough's enough. Here are the best rental trades in baseball history. I just talked a bit about this first trade in my last video about the 2005 Astros rotation, but looking over it for that video made me want to make this video pretty much entirely. The year before winning their first National League pennant in franchise history, the 2004 Astros were arguably a better team. Boasting the same rotation ace trio of Clemens, Pettit, and Oswalt, the Houston lineup also featured the likes of Hall of Famers Craig Biggio and Jeff Bagwell, former MVP winner Jeff Kent, and three-time All-Star Lance Berkman. The team was certainly underachieving though, playing 500 ball throughout the entirety of the 2004 season to the end of July, and they were looking to buy in big to try and win their first World Series. Over in the Central Division in the other league, League, the Kansas City Royals were trending in the opposite direction. They hadn't seen a playoff berth in two decades and wouldn't for another decade, so selling whatever they had that year made a lot of sense. They hadn't gotten a lot right in terms of building a competitive roster, but one thing they definitely nailed was drafting center fielder Carlos Beltran in the second round of the 1995 draft. Since his fourth season in 2001, he was slugging over 500 and swiped over 100 bases in that time frame, all the while playing gold glove caliber defense. In his final year before hitting free agency, the Royals cashed in on a three-team deal. They got a handful of pieces that never moved the needle, the A's got immaculate grid legend Octavio Dotel, and the Astros got a soon-to-be Hall of Famer. In his first season with something to play for, Carlos Beltran exploded. He hit 23 home runs in 90 games, stole 28 bases without getting caught once, and posted a then-career-best 926 OPS, emerging as Houston's top hitter in a wildcard winning season. He was especially incredible in August of that year, clubbing 10 home runs in a single calendar month, walked more times than he struck out, and stole a mind-boggling 16 bases without getting caught. In the entirety of Major League Baseball history, this is unbelievably the only month ever that a hitter collected 10 or more home runs with 15 or more stolen bases. Arguably the greatest month ever by a power-speed threat in the entire sport. In his first playoff run, Beltran hit safely in 10 of the Astros' 12 playoff games. He crushed 4 home runs and collected 9 runs batted in in 5 games to help the Astros conquer the Braves in the NLDS. He then homered in each of the first four games of the NLCS against the Cardinals, running up his tally to eight home runs in nine games and a five-game home run streak. He also made this incredible catch because he can also do that. He's one of just five players ever with eight home runs in a single playoff run, doing so with 14 less plate appearances than his contemporaries. His Astros lost in seven games and lost his attention prioritizing the return of Roger Clemens and Andy Pettit. Beltran signed a massive seven-year deal with the Mets that offseason, a year before the Astros finally made it to the Fall Classic. Considering they only had to give up catcher John Buck to get him, this is arguably the greatest rental trade in baseball history. And what an amazing series it would have been to see the red-hot Carlos Beltran leading the Astros to face off against the curse-breaking Red Sox in a World Series. Alas. A year after trading a massive haul for his services in 2007, the Atlanta Braves found themselves out of the hunt in the season that followed. Seeing themselves 15 games under 500 in late July, Atlanta opted to try and move star first baseman Mark Teixeira. The slugger club 20 home runs in an 100 game span, landing him in the 200 homer club at just age 28. When the Braves nabbed him from Texas, it did cost them their number two, number three, and number four prospects, all of whom would help Texas reach the World Series in consecutive seasons just a few 
few years down the line. That's what made the trade that sent Teixeira to Los Angeles all the more perplexing. The Braves received Angels number 9 prospect Steven Merrick, who never made it to Major League Baseball, and an established first baseman in Casey Couchman, who had been good, but definitely wasn't Mark Teixeira. The 68-40 and 40 Angels added a 900 OPS bat in Teixeira to a lineup already consisting of Hall of Famer Vladimir Guerrero Sr. and Gold Glove center fielder Torrey Hunter. Despite holding a 12-game lead with two months to go, this move was absolutely necessary with the rest of the lineup underperforming if the Angels truly wanted to stand a chance in the playoffs. Mark Teixeira lived up to the hype for a second year in a row on a new team. He hit eight home runs in his first month as an Angel in August. He watched his OPS soar above 1,000 in the second half, making him 81% better than the league average hitter with a 181 OPS+. Plus. The Angels went 36-21 and with Mark in their lineup, en route to an 100-win season in 2008, the only triple-digit win season in franchise history still to this point. In his first playoff series ever, Teixeira put together three multi-hit games, but the Angels lost the series in four games despite each game being decided by two runs or less. LA got all the mileage they could have asked for out of Teixeira, with him putting up 3.5 Fangraphs war in just two months of play. It probably helped that Casey Kochman, the guy they dealt away, was worth half a win in two seasons. The next season, the Yankees got their guy, signing the text message to an eight-year, $180 million deal. The Angels tried to bring Teixeira back in a fruitless attempt, but they did get a compensation draft pick out of it. I wonder who they ended up using that on. Despite just a half a season of play and a disappointing first round exit, the Angels came out the big winners in this deal in my opinion. The 2015 MLB trade deadline is one of the most eventful in the history of the sport. David Price to the Blue Jays, Ioannis Espedes rescued the Mets offense after the Carlos Gomez no trade. I detail these and many more in my video about that year's festivities, but one trade I managed to somehow miss was a deal that the Pittsburgh Pirates swung in pursuit of their third playoff berth in as many years. Sitting 18 games over 500 within striking distance of the first place Cardinals, the Pirates made the move to acquire some much needed starting pitching depth. That's all that Jay Happ appeared to be at first. Depth. On a one year deal with Seattle, Happ was on his way to his fourth straight disappointing year. After becoming a surprise stud for some really good Phillies teams, Happ had endured four years of being at least 10% worse than the league average starting pitcher, according to ERA. The Pirates were able to snag him on deadline day for number 20 prospect in their system, Adrian Sampson, who only ever made one start for the Mariners. Almost instantly, Hap's fortunes changed. After a rough debut, the Pirates won six games in a row started by Jay Hap, a stretch where he tossed 36 innings with 36 punch outs and just four earned runs allowed, including seven shutout innings against the rival Cardinals. From the trade deadline to the end of the season, Hap's 1.85 ERA was the third best in all of baseball. Only Clayton Kershaw and that year's Cy Young, Jake Arrieta, passed him. The Pirates won 98 games thanks to his help, tied for the most in franchise history. With a rotation featuring the likes of rising star Garrett Cole, as well as Lights Out veterans Francisco Liriano and AJ Burnett, there was a legitimate case to be made for Jay Happ getting the ball in the 2015 wildcard game. Cole got the ball instead, but it didn't matter much as Jake Arrieta struck out 11 on the other side and route to a complete game shutout victory. Happ was arguably the best trade made at that year's legendary deadline, but he was one of the few rentals that year that didn't get to play in a single playoff game. He signed a lucrative three-year deal with the Blue Jays, just months removed from being one of the worst qualified starters pitchers in the entire game. Whatever the Pirates managed to unlock with Hap, it was certainly worth it, sneakily making it one of the best rental moves of the 2010s. Let's turn the clock back 15 years. Coming off the first injury-riddled season of his career at age 35, it looked as though 2000 could be the final year in the illustrious career of Will Clark. With nine qualified seasons hitting over 300, four top five MVP finishes, and over 2,000 career hits to his credit, Clark had established himself as a Cooperstown level talent in a 15-year career. Career. Perhaps most impressive was his 301 batting average as a 36 year old in his last season with the Orioles. With Baltimore on the outside looking in that season, the Orioles flipped him in the final season of his two year, $10 million deal. They would get the St. Louis Cardinals unranked prospect Jose Leon, who played just 88 career games with the Birds. As for the Birds, oh wait, I can't call them both the Birds. Shit. Uh, as for the Redbirds, they saw Will Clark turn things up a notch in the middle of their impressive lineup. After losing Mark McGuire for the remainder of the season, Will Clark was acquired solely to fill that void, and he went above and beyond. He put together 11 multi-hit games in his first 24 starts with the team, with an OPS above 1,200 in August. He hit 345 in his final two months in St. Louis, with more extra base hits than singles, and he helped the team surge to a 19-9 record in September, and just their second division crown in the last 
last dozen years. Better yet, his heat carried into the playoffs too in his final pursuit to win a World Series. After winning Game 1 of the NLDS, the Braves seized a 2-0 first inning lead in Game 2, only to see Will Clark crank this missile of a 3-run homer to give the Cardinals a lead they'd never relinquish. They won that game and the next two games to sweep the team of the 90s out of the first round of 2000. Though they wouldn't reach the Fall Classic, Will Clark hit over 300 with an OPS over 1,000 on the Cardinals run that season, hitting safely in each of their eight games played. Despite playing in 130 games and achieving the best single season OPS of his entire career to that point, Will Clark stepped away from the game that year at age 36 to focus on his family. As it stands, he's not only one of the best rental trades ever, but also holds one of the best retirement seasons in baseball history, going out on top. Our final entry will be our most recent entry as well. A year removed from their third consecutive losing season, the Arizona Diamondbacks took a massive step forward in 2017. After winning 17 games three months in a row, the Snakes found themselves beginning July 20 games over 500, but they hit a wall, losing 8 of 9 games and averaging 2.5 runs per game in that span. It was clear that Arizona needed to juice up their lineup to support MVP candidate Paul Goldschmidt and a dominant rotation. Over in Detroit, the Tigers' World Series window was officially closing. In a lineup headed by Miguel Cabrera and Justin Upton, their best hitter that season was easily designated hitter J.D. Martinez, who was set to hit free agency in that offseason. Staring down the barrel of a near 100 loss season, Detroit made plans for a blockbuster move. The Diamondbacks flipped their number 4 and 15 prospects to add J.D. Martinez to their lineup for the final two months of the season. The prospects, Dawo Lugo and Sergio Alcantara, never amounted to much of anything for the Tigers as they entered their dark years. Martinez, though, somehow got even better once he got to the desert. In just 62 games, he clubbed 29 home runs, totaling 45 on the season. He also became the fifth player to reach 40 home runs while playing for two different teams in one season. He shined especially in September, clubbing an astonishing 16 bombs in a 21-game pace, one of just 16 players ever with that many in a single month. This four-homer game he had against the Dodgers definitely helped, one of just 18 players ever to do so. He managed 45 home runs in an MLB-leading 6-9 slugging percentage despite missing the entire first month of the 2017 season. The Diamondbacks couldn't quite catch the Dodgers in the end, but did enough to claim the top wildcard seed in the National League. From there, they conquered the Rockies in the wildcard game to end up matching up with LA in the National League Division Series anyway. JD homered against his future team in that series, going 4 for 15 in the playoffs altogether. He didn't shine much here, but he'd get his first ring the next year after signing a lucrative contract with the Boston Red Sox. Considering the prospect capital they gave up, this big time buy-in by the Diamondbacks was well worth it in the end. And those were the five rental trades I picked out. If I missed a big one, make sure you leave a comment down below and maybe we'll do a sequel to this video. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the Jolly Olive channel. Also ring that bell so you don't miss any future uploads as they come out every Saturday at noon. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys next time.